Good evening and welcome to Network Freestyle. I'm Darren Falwell. And I'm Malcolm Budden. And together we are the Network Freestylers. Today's episode is Freestyle 103. And this one will be giving you a quick spin through the fun and games to be had with Cisco IWAM. But before we get to that, new year, new start, right? Um, how are you doing, Malcolm? How was your festive season? Oh, it was good. It was good. I had a few weeks off, so basically finished up uh, around about the 21st of December uh, and returned to work on uh, the 8th of January. So nice. Well, I would like to say nice and relaxing, but I've got two kids, so <laughs> it's probably two kids under five or under six. So uh, it wasn't that relaxing, but it was good fun. What about yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, similar. I, uh, off on the 21st, back on the 7th. So same same thing. So and I tell you what, I would do that again in a heartbeat. That that two weeks off felt like an eternity, which is uh, fantastic. Plenty of reading, plenty of study. Um, ready and raring to go. Both, I think both our football teams didn't do it too badly over no, the... No, let's not go down. Let's not go down that route, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. I'm, um, yeah, we'll move, move swiftly on. Um, yeah, it uh, yeah. yeah. Mine, mine, mine had a really shaky, shaky November and December, and they started to get a little bit back on track at the end of December. One or two sketchy results. So, uh, here's hoping for a, a new dawn in 2019. Yeah, so, I don't think there's much chance of one for for us, to be honest. But uh, but you know, well, and and the depressing thing is watching the others do so well as well. So uh, my my kids um, both support. Uh, post support Liverpool and Man United. So when you when Arsenal aren't doing well, an Arsenal fan, do you? The, 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 what can I say? You know, <laughs> but but you know the United fan is is um, winding up the Liverpool fan that you know it's the first year in how long that they've got a chance of winning the title. So we shall see. We shall see. No comment. But, uh, yeah. No. Um, Let's gloss over that one, and we'll worry about that next season. Um, yeah. For now. now I let's say that every year of my life, believe it or not. I say that every year of my life, and my heart's <laughs> yeah. Spinning, so. yeah, happy days. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, I won then. It's, I won. Uh, up to the the SD one intro that we done, which turned mm -hmm. into an hour and a half uh, on I think <laughs> on an intro to SD one. But I mean, this is like a uh, when, you, when you just look at the GUI side of things, it looks like it's straightforward. But if you look under the hood, that's where it can, you know, yeah. uh, get a bit complicated. And um, IWAN is basically the uh, one of the the first iterations of SD1. Um, so we figured, although it's uh, you know it's kind of being superseded now by Viptela, or it will be longer term. That's just was. Sort of roadmap for their SD1 product or portfolio. Um, it is still out there. Uh, I mean, since 2000, early 2017, uh, started talking about it a, a lot more in 2016. Um, but since my first I1 that I worked on in 2017, I've worked on four different I1s. So I was going to say, you've got a, bit of, a fair yeah. bit of experience on that now, haven't you? So. Um, um, it's I've I've touched an IWAN implementation, pff, hey, skirting around the edges of it. So I'll have to bow to your superior knowledge on this one. But no, I mean I think I think the main the main, the main point here is that uh, although although it's not like the the go to product uh, now, um, you will see some of the some of the stuff like uh, um, for example um, the even the design documents have been archived in the Cisco CBD area, which we'll show that. Uh, where you can still get the information, but there, are, if you go to the SD1 uh, or the WAN design zone, it's all SD1, SD1, uh, this, SD1, that, but it all actually relates to Viptela stuff. And yeah. you actually have to click through to an archived area of the design zone to access the documents and the configuration templates. However, um, it is still out there, uh, and the, 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 the IWANs that I've worked on have ranged from I1 1.0, which is still out there uh, in in that sort of kind of flavour, uh, up to you know I think the last version that they're going to be uh, releasing and delaying. Uh, sorry, 
uh, developing is I think it's I one two point three or something now. I don't know how they're how far they're taking it, but there's obviously been quite a few different iterations which have come yeah. uh, with different feature sets. But we're really just going to talk about like the latest I one. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, we need to do another ten episodes on I one. And <laughs> to be honest, it's not a it's not a it's not really something that people are going to be going out and deploying from now on, which is sort of illustrated by the fact that Cisco have uh, uh, sunset the documentation into the archive, yeah. That that said, I mean, obviously, the elements of it are all um, uh, Cisco features from, from you know, over the years, aren't they? So it'd be yeah. interesting just to step through those and see how they're all put together, I guess, to, uh, to, to show how I went. Um, was yeah. built and continues to be operated. So, um, yeah. yeah. So uh, let me just see. Uh, do, 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 where do we start here? So hopefully this should this presentation should work. Right. So similar format to like the last network freestyle that we've done, and this is this is the format that we're going to use for every single one, unless you know if we get into like a different format of like the 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 shows or whatever, we might change it, but otherwise we're going to get five or six bullet points we're going to work through them uh, try not to labor them too much whilst also giving information to the audience to uh, understand what we're talking about um, one of the things uh, that that we want to make clear is this is not a beginner session we're not going to teach you as such what is dmvpn what is pfr what is bgp uh, we're going to talk about it uh, to some level uh, but we're going to assume that the audience that are watching this, this is probably bordering onto an intermediate to an advanced uh, video, um, because instead of looking at like, uh, you know, the, the, the high level and then uh, how the high level works from a GUI perspective, we're really actually going to uh, explain it, not in uh, detail of every single component, but we will go into details about, uh, it's as if you lift the hood on like the GUI. <laughs> And yeah, Cisco, I, I guess allows you to do it's not that. about the config, right? So yeah, yeah. Cisco I one allows you to do that, and all of their these uh, configuration guides and design guides that are out there are all uh, that you know when it when it was released, uh, which we'll talk about with the components in a second. But uh, when it was released, the idea was that you would have like a um, a, a GUI interface, the like a um, like a web interface that you'd be able to go and all you would need to do is plug your router in and uh, and uh, it would provision automatically with zero touch provisioning. It would inherit the IWAN, the policy router, the policy or performance routing or PFR policy routing uh, for layer seven applications to send traffic up link one or link two, etc. Um, and to an extent that that was delivered, but it was delivered for basically for greenfield deployments. So if you were going to wrap your WAN deploy at Greenfield, uh, you'd probably be able to use APIC EM, which was the tool that was developed for that. Um, it does have some nice features. We'll talk about it later uh, at the um, when we talk about the management stuff. Sure. Um, so, so yeah, so rewind and then uh, the, other, the other thing that we're going to do is in the last SD1 video, we're going to use this probably for uh, Hopefully you can see that diagram there. This was a diagram that we talked through uh, quite a few different examples in the SD1 generic session. So uh, I don't know. Darren's going to present on the Viptela session, but we might we might or might not uh, use this uh, for all the SD1 sessions. There might be some other sessions after. Uh, it's just to get a familiar format. So uh, what we're going to talk about then is uh, in the first point. Um, if we go back to the presentation, uh, the first point is uh, IWAN components. So uh, this, rather than um, talk about like master controller and, and that purely like the master controller and stuff, um, I'm going to like whiz through that. But I'm also going to talk about um, uh, I'm also going to talk about like the protocols and stuff like that. So. Uh, and the following, and the follow on from uh, talking about uh, what actual components like master controllers, border routers, um, we'll also talk about like the protocols and, and the different options, and that'll 
uh, you know, that'll highlight why it's potentially a very complex solution because yeah. th there's no real, like, when you roll out an IWAN, um, you've got design documents that you follow, uh, but there's no, there's nothing to force you to use any particular variation of those components. So um, you could use uh, BGP or uh, EIGRP as a routing protocol in the overlay, but there's nothing to say uh, um, the, uh, the, it works best with those routing protocols. I was going to say it's not prescriptive, right? Because you essentially what you're doing is taking Cisco um, IOS the way the, the same as we've always had, and you're using the features that are already there, but assembling them to 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 um, to give you that I one um, as per a set of design um, standards, right? So yeah, I, I get where you're coming from with that. Yeah. So so to like um, right. So let me let me go back. The last the last oh, didn't mean to do that. Um, the last video we talked about like the different components. I'm just going to list them out again. Uh, I'm not going to labour about what they are because hopefully now they should be understood. Uh, yeah, so we covered like the different components uh, at a high level for SD WAN, uh, and in the last video, so we're assuming that the audience, if you're watching this, uh, you either will uh, pick it up and understand it. If you've got any questions about any of the content of the show, you can contact Darren or myself directly. Um, uh, we'll, all give, the we'll give the details available. at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Right, so so what are the IWAN components? That was point one. So uh, we're going to talk about like the actual components. So uh, we need hubs, which was explained in the last episode. We need spokes. So the hubs are typically uh, the brains of the operation and we get in respect to uh, routing uh, and holding like the control plane information. Uh, how who 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 resides where? Um, but we'll talk about that uh, functionality uh, as we move through the presentation. Spokes are typically uh, your spoke sites. You see them pictured down the bottom of the, you know, the diagram. Like these are the sites down here. Um, uh, in regard to, uh, uh, we described policy control uh, in the last video. So policy control in respect to IWAN would be uh, the master controller. Um, master controller. Uh, is the device on the network? Um, we have two. You've, you actually have two categories. You have a uh, hub master controllers, and then you have local master controllers. So local master controllers will be. Uh, oh, oh, and just to just to um, uh, summarise that, that is actually PFR V3. So performance routing version three. That is your policy control and the PFR v3 protocol is configured on your master controller. Now, uh, I'm not going to write these ones out. What we also need um, is underlays networks. So these are also referred to as transports. Uh, we need, what else do we need? We need overlays. So um, uh, I'll not go into detail, but let's say like that's overlay one um, and that's overlay overlay two. Uh, I mean, you know, we we illustrated all this stuff on how all that connects together in the last video. Uh, so I'm not dwelling on it just now. Um, yeah, like that as a quick and quick and dirty sketch. Um, and then we, uh, within those overlays, uh, we need uh, some sort of routing mechanism. Uh, and how 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 the IWAN stack up, um, is put together is you have these hub and spoke and master controller. They're like I think of those as like actual components, but then you configure those components in a way to actually uh, deliver an IWAN. So at the bottom, you have like the underlay network. So that's like your MPLS, your internet, transport. Um, you might have multiple internet. Uh, so you, you might have multiple MPLS or yeah. multiple um, uh, internet transports. And you may have like something like 4G. You might have satellite broadband. Uh, you, you could have any, any form of transport, but you run the overlay on top. Uh, the, the, you then have the overlays in this instance are DMVPN tunnels. 
Right, so, I was just going to ask that. Yeah, yeah. okay. So yeah, so to clarify, uh, the overlay network, um, uh, yeah, I think I think the overlays in this scenario because um, a DMVPN tunnel is an overlay, right? So yeah. you you have like an overlay per transport typically in IWAN. So if you have like um, uh, if you have like two transports like in this diagram, you would have like a DMV. So if you take those numbers in the blue. That's just think of that as like tunnel one, and that would be tunnel one everywhere that that blue line connects to. Um, if you look at the red uh, overlay, that would be a DMVPN tunnel number two. Uh, I think the tunnels are actually locally significant, but uh, yeah. to the to the river. But like obviously, from a good design practice perspective, you would make that tunnel two everywhere, so. and the other yeah. one tunnel one so. yeah. simplifies the configuration. Now. Um, what we talked about in the last video, and I'll even do it in the same color, so hopefully uh, everybody can stay on uh, on par, is and because at that stage, right, you've got two DMVPN tunnels, but they're just tunnels, right? So you could you could route at this point, right? You've got a DMVPN tunnel that which is being facilitated by the underlay network, and at this point, what you would be able to do from a connectivity perspective, if I use uh, Orange as a traffic flow here. You would be able to ping, for example, from this router to here, but you wouldn't. You and, and until you actually put some sort of routing mechanism in place, you wouldn't be able to ping from here into here. Right. Okay. For example, right. So, so, so what you're yeah. saying there is the the LAN um, routing at both your data centers and the hubs and the and the sites. Um, yeah. uh, in folks, you're not exposing that routing uh, or not passing that routing over the transport network, right? You, you're you yeah. just literally the transport is just routing between the, the hubs and the spokes. Exactly. And and those and, and between the hubs and the spokes, um, <clears throat> between the hubs and the spokes, these DMVPN tunnels, uh, they can terminate directly on the WAN interface. Um, which is typical, especially at spoke sites. However, you may want to terminate those tunnels on a loopback interface. And we're not going to really have time, I don't think, because we're trying to keep this to a sensible uh, sensible amount of time this session. But in the first I1 that I worked in, uh, worked on, um, <clears throat> if I use a different color, uh, let's just say, um, Let's just say we had to, we, we had loopbacks um, and we needed to be able to, let's say we had another cloud here, uh, another underlay that we had, uh, we had to be able to um, terminate a tunnel on here. So the loopback had to be advertised, well, that way, all the right. way out over this to this site out here, um, but also like this way. Um, okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If, if if we didn't need this, like you know, this back door like tunnel, and this all relates to fast failover and all that with PFR, yeah. um, because basically for for SD WAN in general and specifically IWAN, you need uh, every site to have a tunnel to every transport in order for it to uh, fast failover, because it's all part of like one. You know, one if you talk about like data centers and that, it's like one big fabric. But yeah, that's that's a really advanced uh, design in I one. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna like not on that. Um, oh, I wish I could just. Uh, so I'll leave it like that just now. So recapping, we have hubs and spokes and master controllers, uh, which are physical components, so effectively routers, right? Uh, we also have like um, management platforms, uh, which would be like either Cisco Prime or APIC EM, which I think stands for Enterprise Manager. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so th those are two two platforms, um, uh, and then we have the underlays, which are the trans transports, typically two. Uh, most of the deployments I've seen have been like hybrid one MPLS, one internet, or some people actually still deploy uh, two, two MPLS, 
you know, MPLS provider one, MPLS provider two. So uh, it just depends. But yeah. more common than not, it's hybrid. Like, so MPLS plus INET. Yeah. yeah. On top of the INET, you have like, the, in, in the IWAN perspective, you have DMVPN tunnels, which just basically makes uh, that transport a big LAN. Uh, and then you advertise like um, these orange networks into that like blue overlay um, or the red overlay. Now, how that's achieved is you configure, and we'll show, we'll snow, show a snapshot uh, of some of the configurations that's one big BGP process, uh, IBGP process, right? So um, we touched on this before, um, and I know that like it's slightly different in Viptela where they use like a protocol called OMP okay, for yeah. all this stuff, which we'll cover in the in the different session. But basically, what happens uh, in IWAN is these DMVPN hubs, uh, once they're once they're part of the like DMVPN. Um, basically, we configure these hubs as root reflectors, um, and these spokes down the bottom, which I'll not highlight anymore, they're they're, high, they're circled in black. These are root reflector clients, right? And the idea here is, um, if I just erase all this ink uh, for a moment, right, and uh, quickly, I'll just quickly draw the overlays back in. Just, uh, in fact, don't even need to do that. Um, <clears throat> if you if you picture like there's uh, overlays, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and and uh, if I just say like this is one site and this is another site, uh, these are these are all root reflectors at this level. Yeah. Okay. Um, what's basically happening here is, uh, uh, we'll we'll talk about um, DMVPN, but basically if if this site needs to talk to this site um, uh, it needs to know how to get to that LAN right and as things stand uh, as I as I explained before when the overlay DMVPN tunnel is up um, you only really know how to get to the router but not beyond so what happens is this uh, if I advertise this uh, for put this in red so what i'm about to show is the routing advertisement so that big bgp process that i was talking about um these routes which i've highlighted in red would be advertised up to like these root reflectors right and these root reflectors in the hub so these are hubs in the iwan uh, domain uh, i'm about to use a nice pink color what, what those hubs will do is they will reflect the routes back down to here. So if this if this network is um, 10.20.20.0, and this is 10.10.10.0, um, what happens is uh, these, these routers here, learn about this subnet from these root reflectors. But what it says is if you want to basically have this traffic flow, okay, between these two sites, obviously via the transport, then what you need to do is build a DMVPN tunnel directly to this site here, right? So, so, if I'm on this, if I'm on, uh, you know, this site here, I've got a PC. Yep, that's a PC. Uh, and and I want to, can't even see the bottom of it, ran out of space. But uh, if that's a PC, right, uh, let's just, let's make it, that's site one, that's site two. So if site one uh, wants to send traffic to site two, so this PC down here uh, at the bottom here, if this wants to send traffic from site one to site two, what happens initially um, is it, it it basically sends the traffic, um, and this is this is part of like DMVPN phase three. It sends the first few packets. Uh, how do I illustrate this? 
Um, it sends the first in another color. Uh, it sends the first few packets like that up to yeah. like the hub. The but hub, the hub right. sends, yeah, the hub sends the the hub sends a, a a message back, which is called like an NHRP redirect, and it says if you want to send to site two, then this whatever IP address is on this interface, and that would be either the WAN interface or the loopback wherever the DMVPN tunnel would terminate. Um, yeah. you, need to, you need to build a tunnel to here. So right. that would just say it would be over this under this overlay. So what would happen there is like the DMVPN tunnel would go like that. And then the traffic, the traffic flow, running out of colors to use here, but the traffic <laughs> flow, let's use orange because the LAN is orange. The traffic flow would would initially go up via that blue line, but yeah. then it then it would like start sending traffic and a DM a direct DMVPN tunnel would be established between those two. So um that's that's like sort of like the general operation of just building the DMVPN tunnel and the routing information. And that's all achieved via like a single IBGP process. Um I think I kind of went off on uh, a tangent a little bit there in regards to no, the agenda so we, the, the next thing to cover was the underlay routing anyway so you've pretty much boxed that uh, yeah that's no, all good yeah so um so yeah so so just a recap on that then uh in a very high level summary so um Spoke sites. This is before we. This is before we even get into any like policy control and PFR version three. Yeah, that's that's kind of the point, isn't it? You've got to have uh, the sites routing in some way, shape, or form before you can even get to that. So that's that's mm -hmm. yeah needs explaining. So that's good. Yeah. So um, so so point number one is that uh, we need to have an underlay uh, that that can facilitate an overlay. Right. Um, and once we have uh, and that's and think of underlay as like your MPLS network provider, your Internet network provider, your 4G uh, LTE and in the future, probably 5G, etc. Um, so, so that's 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 what the underlay, the overlay is your DMVPN tunnels. Uh, and then you need a routing protocol to uh, uh, basically transport the the LAN information. So how you how do you propagate that information into BGP? Typically with network statements, aggregate statements, uh, your typical BGP advertisement, and then obviously the you know the 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 routers on the network. Uh, when you start propagating that LAN in, information uh, into BGP, um, if you've got like the LAN here, and then that's 10.x whatever, uh, yeah. and and this is like BGP. Uh, and this is like like these sites are like OSPF. Uh, you have to have like you'll you'll have like these LAN subnets in the in the root in the rib uh, of these routers here already. Um, so, and then yeah, you advertise them like with network statements or aggregate statements uh, into uh, BGP. Uh, so okay. that's from the support site perspective. And then uh, at the data center, it's uh, a little bit different. Um, because you have to uh, do a couple of different things, but we'll talk about that when we get to PFR. Okay. Um, just, just, just for my own sanity, then. So, you've cool. got obviously um, at the sites there where you've got um, two routers. Um, you've got um, essentially one has uh, a DMVPN tunnel interface into one of your overlays, the other one into the other one. They'll cool. have a routing table containing all the LAN uh, subnets. For anything that's connected to that to that overlay, right? Um, I guess yeah. the idea is you have to have those addresses and those subnets in the routing table. Fundamentally, in order to route traffic, you need that to have that, right? And before you get to the policy or anything like that, you you need that 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 opportunity. Yeah, um, so the routing needs to be so, working. So, yeah, so so just yeah, just to recap, that's a good point. Just to recap on that, right? So so the the um, if we go back to this scenario and then just say this is the 10, 20, 20 yeah. network, right? So 
this 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 site works as a uh, we'll talk about PFR and how that makes those two routers act as one one single system in a minute. But um, so so let's say let's say I need to get to 10 2020, um, and then let's say um, <clears throat> how 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 um, this site sees this route yeah. as it sees it that it's learned it from here. Yeah. In the routing table now, yeah. when you actually want to send traffic here, right? That's why it sends traffic up to the route reflector or the DMVPN hub initially. Yeah. After that DMVPN hub receives that packet from site one saying that I want to speak, I'm going to send traffic to 10 2020, which is site two. That's when it says. Right, well, you learned that route from me. However, if you want to talk to that site, don't come via me. Build a tunnel. And that's when it sends an NHRP redirect to build this, like, um, you know, this uh, dynamic, dynamic, dynamic tunnel. tunnel. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Right. So, so, so that's, yeah, that's that's how it works. So yeah. it learns well, the fund route. Fundamentally, that you've got to have that route in the routing table in the first place anyway. Because... Absolutely. You do right because that's that's rooting, but uh, or, yeah, I guess or, I guess the, the fun comes with the policy, right? Yeah, or you could advertise a default route from your hub. Of course. Of course. So, so you, you could. So, you could, so long as the hub knows could, where to go. Yeah. 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 So 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 yeah. I mean, as long as as long as that your site uh, knows how to get. Um, let me just see. You yeah. need a route in the routing table that covers your destination, right? Is what we're saying. Right, but, and that could Whether be a default route, but more yeah. often than not, it's something more granular, like a t even a 10 slash 8 uh, yeah. might be advertised or, ag yeah. or aggregated, right? So the route reflector will have all the routes in the routing table, but the route reflector hub might only advertise out a summary route or an aggregate yeah. address. Yeah. Something. All that as, long as, as long as those then routes then, are in the network, yeah, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So it can get. So, okay. so that's how you have to understand BGP and how it works as well. Yeah. Uh, that said, you can also use EIGRP. I was going to say you've got with EIGRP other options, right? Yeah. I, I've never deployed it or seen it de or EI, seen EIGRP deployed in the overlay, but a lot of the Cisco example configs of which I've got some. Uh, that we're going to maybe, if we've got time to look through a couple of examples, um, they do use the IGRP and uh, uh, I know the, the I1 deploy session used it as well. Uh, yeah, which is the only one I ever saw had uh, the EIGRP running over, but and, and I think it was again back in the day when we did DMVPN uh, alone, the EIGRP was was the usual choice for for land to land route in you know, DMVPN. So yeah, no. That's uh, understood. Cool. So we've sort of ploughed through. I'm just looking, looking I'm back at this. Oh, sorry, Dan. On you go. No, no, no. I was just, I was just going to say, it looks like we've covered off um, the component stuff and and the bulk of the underlay routing there. So, uh, um, yeah, do you want to just yeah, just have a look? Uh, so no, that's great because it flows better, right? If you're, if you're stepping through. Everything's good. Yeah. So yeah. So it will probably. I just want to flip back just to explain one more thing about the the underlay because it's important, right? Um, and it's especially for migrations. I'm, uh, I'm trying, uh, whiz through it, right? But um, yeah. And then we'll move on to PFR. But like, just going back to like establishing the DMVPN tunnels. Um, so. I've worked on, again, as I say, I've worked on a hybrid and also, like, I've even worked on um, an IWAN which had, like, four MPLS hubs, but it was all over the same transport. Okay. So, so four MPLS hubs, so two data centers, four MPLS hubs. So, uh, like, if you, look at, if you look at this diagram that's in front of you, picture, like, another two, uh, another two uh, of these. Right, but all uh, how how they were actually connected were like this. So they were all connected to the same MPLS cloud. So the redundancy right. for the MPLS wasn't it wasn't two MPLS clouds. It was 
it was four hubs across two data centers. And then they had like two hubs, one in each data center for uh, internet. Now, um, uh, this was like migrating from a, a non IWAN L3 VPN to the same, but in keeping the four hubs and then migrating to like an IWAN. So the underlay that, uh, or, or the, the MPLS, which was going to become the underlay, was still just like the WAN for the sites oh, yeah. that, that so, hadn't. So what, what you were yeah. doing was putting the MVPN overlay over the top of the same network that they were already using to do the transport, right? Single L3 VPN network, yeah. So yeah. four hubs, yeah. Right, now, <clears throat> that, that, uh, and then also like these guys down here, so that was EBGP before I won, that was, e these were all EBGP uh, and uh, like this MPLS network, yeah. right? When you go to Iwan, um, if you think if you if we draw it, uh, if we draw a service provider PE here, right, which connects to a CE here, yeah, and this is running eBGP obviously to propagate these LAN routes, yeah, uh, via eBGP. Now, when you actually go to Iwan, you can continue to use eBGP. But when you when you use eBGP, all you need to advertise into it is this WAN interface or the loopback where the DMVPN tunnel is going to terminate. And what we actually done at the uh, spoke sites in that particular scenario is we done away with eBGP on the PE to CE link. Yeah. And this was just static a default. Uh, and the reason that we could get away with that at the spoke sites is because um, we were terminating the tunnel on the WAN interface, the WAN interface. which was connected, yeah. connected to the PE and we confirmed yeah. with the service provider that they were doing, uh, they were advertising that transport link uh, for like monitoring purposes and that. So it meant that like we could, we could get like to that link from like from and then and then because it's following the default route this guy knows about all these hubs from yeah, yeah. the rest of it well not the not the internet one but the rest of the mpls network because yeah those are advertised in via ebgp so, so so basically you weren't adding you weren't adding any more customer routing into the mpls network the the only um additional routes in the mpls network were the connected interfaces the subnets of the connected interfaces going between the PE and the new ca yeah. right yeah. They, and they were already reachable they were already reachable so we were actually just removing bgp routes we were yeah. we were reducing the underlay routing table size rather than yeah. you know we were just removing it from a uh, removing it from the bgp process the ebgp process and then we were advertising it via the IBGP process that oh, and, and under the neighbors that were now relevant to like the tunnel interfaces. Um, so, so gradually, so I guess as you did the migration, the LAN addressing came out of the EBGP process and appeared into yeah. the tunnel route to, to be routed across that way. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. And, and pretty much if you strip that back and you say, but well, what is that actually doing? It's just like getting a spoke site with an internet connection. Because 99 times out of 100, a spoke site is just going to have a default route to the ISP. And it's just yeah. emulating that same behavior, but on an MPLS network. Well, it's a stub network, isn't it? It's not going to, it's not never going to be used as a transit. So it doesn't need to to have anything more than the than the default route. So, yeah, yeah. understood. Well, I just thought that was important on the underlying. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, before we deployed it, it was the first IWAN that we had done. And before we had deployed it, we were thinking about how we're going to do the ebgp versus ibgp and all that and then and then you know we we played about with it in the lab and we're like we only need a default route here yeah. because we yeah. just but then it was like caveated by well the service provider has to support it uh, has to advertise that statement uh, so sorry that that pe to ce subnet 
Uh, and the other re way that would not work, and you would need to use BGP, is if you were terminating the uh, the tunnels on a loop back right. interface at the spoke site. Yeah. Uh, right. So you would need to do one or two things. You would need to get the service provider to do a static route on every PE of your network when you've got hundreds of sites. That's that's just not feasible. Um, yeah. Or you run uh, eBGP and all you advertise into eBGP is the loop back that the DMVPN tunnel is going to terminate on. Gotcha. So, Cool. So yeah, that was uh, that was that was uh, we we had we had a great lab set up and all that. So we managed to iron out almost that stuff. So um, so yeah, so so that's where we are. So so now where we are is uh, um, one final thing on the which I won't go into in detail. Show a quick picture of it, how complicated it can get. But um, Iwan is mul is uh, VRF aware as well. So again, the first Iwan that I done it was. Uh, it was like six six VRFs. I think there's a maximum of 20 uh, that you can do because it's VRF light. And I think that's just really one of these limits that basically Cisco have come up with um, uh, from doing it in the lab environment. And there's like uh, guidelines and limitations like with every other technology uh, that you need to abide by in order to for it to be a supportable solution. But yeah. basically, once you, once you crack how uh, IOAN works for one VRF, then you can create, you know, uh, it can be a little bit tricky. There's things that come up, but the actual configuration, the dot deployment, and the rollout is a repeatable process. So you do it like for like the global routing table or your default VRF, um, and we'll show it in like one of the CVDs. I want to, I, I do want to show that before uh, uh, we finish. So I guess um, what yeah, I guess uh, what you're doing there is creating a um, another overlay for each VRF you want to extend. Is it? Yeah. So basically, yeah. So so basically, if you've got um, if you've got INET and uh, MPLS transports, uh, and you've got two VRFs, um, let's just say uh, VRF ten is for um customer, well, or via via VRF uh VRF A is for uh, DMVPN tunnel 10 um, MPLS um, and then VRF, uh, VRF A for INET might be tunnel 20 yeah um, they're both VRF A right, right. Yeah. then if you had like the second VRF um, you would create a new tunnel for the MPLS transport, yeah. Um, for the uh, for the MPLS, so that would be yeah. tunnel thirty. Yeah. And then you you, it, you go into the under the tunnel um, configuration inter interface configuration and do VRF forward and whatever VR. VRF yeah. under the tunnel. So it's like if you had loads of different transports, uh, you create a new tunnel. But yeah. If you have loads of different transports and loads of, and and multiple VRFs, you you have to create more tunnels, uh, yeah. uh, like per VRF. So you're you're multiplying the amount of tunnels by the amount of VRFs. Yeah. And when you've got like, your transport five, still, still the same transport. Well, same transport. Yeah. Transport for, um, uh, yeah, for the for the for the underlay, I guess. But yeah. yeah. Same, same transport and the same. DMVPN tunnel termination interface. Yeah. So let's say if it was like gig zero 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 that you terminated your tunnels on, that would that even that that would be the um, under the DMVPN tunnel configuration. Yeah. You do like a tunnel interface a gig zero 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 or whatever the command is. We can look at it later. Um, but that would be uh, your tie-in DMVPN tunnel ten to gig zero zero zero. You're tying DMVPN tunnel 20, 30, 40, all to gig 000. That's just that's just where the 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 it's like the front door of VRF, which yeah. I don't know if yeah, I'm I was just going to say is yeah yeah yeah. I don't know if cool. I'm going to explain that, but that's like the front door of VRF, and it's basically the roadblock. Whereas if you were trying to route natively into that site over the underlay when it's being configured with a front door VRF, you wouldn't be able to do it. It's like no. a roadblock. You you come over. You're encrypted. You're encrypted over the link, uh, as far as the um, uh, 
uh, and then it terminates on like the DM uh, the front door VRF interface and yeah. it's encapsulated up to that point and then it gets decapsulated yeah. and pumped out and in, inside the router and then yeah. it gets pushed out of the LAN side in the appropriate VRF. Yeah. So you could come over DMVPN tunnel 10 in VRF A and then come out the LAN side in VRF B unless you've done some mad root leak root leak in between VRFs. But yeah. or, uh, or or someone's cabled something to something they shouldn't have done. Yeah, yeah. I know what you say. So so yeah, so that that's kind of like uh, underlay, overlay, and uh, as I mentioned a no, minute ago, that there was one other thing. Sorry, mate, I meant to mention that you, you talked about encryption there, obviously, um, in, with the yeah. DMVPN. Um, you've got the usual kind of PKI pre-shared key certificate thing there, right? That you need yeah. to deal with. Yeah. So that, again, there's a, like a there's an IWAN uh, uh, PKI encryption like that. There's about eight different guides on I on I Right, uh, and one of them is purely about like the encryption side. So you can basically uh, go with a pre-shared key, or you can go with like a PKI uh, certificate, where you need a certificate um, server. Where you, that could be like your master controller. It could be another router on your network. Uh, pre-shared key, self-explanatory, well known. Uh, what the pros and cons <laughs> are, for that. Um, PKI in particular, if people aren't even familiar with DMVPN and and uh, uh, you know certificates and stuff like that, the main thing that you need to worry about is when your certificate expires. How do you handle that, right? So if it's uh, certificate problem, yeah. yeah, yeah. So and and there is there is a solution. So again, I think like the first I one that I worked on, it was multi VRF. It was six different uh, site types. It had uh, PKI. Um, so it's probably the most complicated I1 that you could ever <laughs> ever actually roll out. But you know, we, we we did roll it out and um at uh, like from like just talking in generic terms, if you go with that certificate based approach, there's a good document on the Cisco website that talks about how to auto roll over um mm -hmm. your certificates. So it, it basically can detect or 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 and, and and the thing about the thing that's good about that is that um, you might actually have sites that are like rolling out at different times as well. So uh, I can't remember exactly how it works off the top of my head, but there's a there's a there's a few commands that you can put into. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the the hub and the spoke side. It's definitely at the hub side that um, it has to uh, not has to. That's the wrong word. But it, it basically can uh, automatically renew the certificate when it gets right. within a certain. I think it's called auto rollover or something yeah. like that. But, it like yeah. synchronizes the uh, the certificate lifetimes yeah. and stuff. Oh yeah, okay. The key, yeah. the key. Lifetimes. Okay. So okay. yeah, so that's the usual kind of challenges with that, right? So um, right. So moving on then. So PFR version three. Before yeah. before I had um, like kind of like dealt with I one. I had never so part PFR performance routing. Is an evolution, uh, is it OER, uh, optimized yeah, edge route? First, yeah, yeah. So, so that's like um, that's like PFR version one. I think it's optimized edge route, and I think that's what it stands for. Yes. And then that, yeah, that 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 changed its name uh, to to PFR, right? But it didn't go from OER to PFR. It went from OER to PFR version two. Right, so PFR version two uh, had some enhancements around it, um, and and uh, again, ask us offline if you want to know more, or you want a even a separate session just on that technology. We can do it. But PFR version two, think of it as it's a distributed policy, uh, and what I mean by that is like. Uh, uh, if I if we go to the the diagram right the PFR let, let's say we've got more sites all over the place these are all separate sites and wherever I wherever I uh, circle in orange that is its own PFR version two policy that has a config on that router that you have to go into this router this router. This, these routers, this router, and even if you template it and you roll out the same policy to every site, 
Uh, it's it's got pros and cons. The the the, the I'll start with the cons is it could get messy and difficult. When you see a PFR config in a minute, uh, you'll see how it could get very messy. Um, uh, so so that's the con. The pro is if you have a problem at a specific site, and again, I've had to uh, work on troubleshooting an issue uh, on a different i1 than the one I was talking about, where um, one, one particular application was uh, dropping its connection, its TCP connection, it's timing out, it's rooting the wrong way. Basically, asymmetric routing um, uh, was the suspected cause of it. And we took it out, we, we tweaked the PFR policy at that particular site. And once we validated that it fixed the issue, uh, we then started rolling it out to other select sites, right? So that's the difference between PFR version two um, and, the, and going back. So PFR has two main components. Uh, it has the master controller, so MC, you'll see it mentioned everywhere. Um, the thing to remember is like there's an MC, and re regardless of which version of PFR 2 or 3, there's an MC at every site. Now, the MC, the master controller, is basically the guy with the brains that holds the policy to say, uh, root, tra root, like we talked on, I'm not going to go over it, uh, in detail again, but basically, uh, if we've got app one, and then uh, we want that to go out that way, and then if we've got, oh, reds are wrong, there's a bad color for that, app two in blue, go that way, right? So in PFR version two, you could do it on, like, let's say the master controller, say that was like spoke. Uh, the, you see it, I've highlighted it there, the MC slash BR. So it's a master controller and a border router, right? A border router is the guy that takes instructions from the master controller to perform this uh, this type of blue goes that way, green goes that way. Now, um, if, if we've got, uh, let's say this site, for example, if it was connected to the INET and, um, INET and the MPLS network, what you could have is uh, with PFR version two, is that going that way and that going that way. Why you would want to do that uh, is beyond me, because you would, even though you're distributed deployment, you would still want to have a common policy in general, but you might have like different categories of sites. So you might have like uh, sites that you, that, you, that you have to make those decisions based on the business requirements. Now, uh, that, do you think that covers the, the concept of PFR version two? Yeah, I, I think I think so. So let me just recap from from what I'm taking from that is you've got basically for each each site um, you've got uh, a master controller that, that that owns the policy for the site, and then you've got border routers multiples of um, that that are actually responsible for listening to what the master controller tells it. Um, and and diverting traffic in a given a given direction based on that policy, um, assuming that obviously between all of the board, the border routers they have all the routing they need to make that happen. But is yeah. that fair? Yeah, okay. and yeah, yeah, I think I think I think I've got that. The the other thing obviously is the the applications you mentioned there. Um, one application um, definition can be sent in one direction, one one in another. Um, how do we choose what, what those applications are and, and how do we determine whether the traffic is is based on one of those applications? Yeah, so uh, I'm not actually, I'm pretty sure PFR version 2 works in the same way, but right, so right. when you switch PFR version, when you switch PFR on, um, this is one of the things I had to get my head around when uh, okay. the first I1 that I deployed was, um, uh, because of some NetFlow configs and that that you can put uh, to report on all this stuff and where it's going and, and, and all that. Uh, but that's actually disconnected from PFR in order to make it function, uh, okay. switch to NetFlow, right? So when you switch on PFR, certainly with version 3, but I'm almost certain with version 2 as well, um, it enables NBAR2 in the, in the router and the PFR process mm -hmm. automatically. So you don't have to then go or uh, match application, in bar or whatever on anything. 
right? PFR has that functionality inherent within it. So what you do is you say um, in the PFR policy, and I think we definitely need to show a snippet of the config to get this point across, but you've basically in PFR version three, which we'll talk about how that differs to PFR version two, um, P, the, the main thing with PFR version two is it, uh, it's distributed, like so, right, and you can customize it by a policy. The PFR version three, it's a, it works on a peering model, so you uh, centralize your master control, your hub master controller. They introduced yeah. the concept of a hub master controller, um, which is pictured at, uh, 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 yeah, it's, it's pictured as policy SDN controller. So I'll explain that in a minute. But yeah, you centralize that and you break it out into a separate thing, and all of the master controllers, you still have a master controller at all your sites. Yeah. But instead of having to log on to the the, the router uh, at the remote site, so I don't have to like log on to this router down here, go into yeah. like the bar configuration, then configure like say application one goes over link one and a, and app, application two goes over link two. Um, what happens is you 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 uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but you basically have this site down here, this yeah. site down here, the yeah. peer uh, over. Uh, over the network, and then um, if I take a different color, uh, policy gets sent down here. Sure. Uh, and then once you, once you, e even if this dies, the policy is still in here. Yeah. Right, because it's pushed the config out to that site. Now, it, the, one of the limitations with that, it, it, it massively simplifies the configuration, um, but it's uh, it's if you want to do any customization, you can't per se. Right. Okay. So it has to be the same policy at every yeah. site. Yeah, it pushes that policy out to every site. So if you if okay. you say Citrix like, traffic always goes over internet as a primary, uh, regardless of whether it's a one a half a meg link or a ten meg link or a hundred meg link, it always goes over the internet link, right? Then that's it for your enterprise. Whereas if you had PFR version two, uh, it's harder to, or it could be harder to manage and troubleshoot. Um, yeah. The thing, the thing to remember about PFR though, right, is if it dies, your network isn't down. No. Necessarily. Because you've still got That's routes, necessary. right? To all yeah. the to all the networks. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. So you can fall back, fall back to the rib, basically. Yeah. So what happens is this is what I was talking trying to explain earlier why it's a layered approach. So you have the underlay routing, that's purely to establish DMVPN tunnels. Yeah. Then you 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 set up your DMVPN tunnels and you run yeah. a route protocol on top of that um, effect. Yeah. And then on top of BGP or EIGRP, you would run PFR on top. And it's like an optimization routing technique rather than if, P, if the master controller goes down, or even if you, lo you lose your policy uh, at your at your spoke site down here, even if you lose your policy, you, as long as you've still got a link up in your DMVPN tunnel up, you're you're just going to basically follow either BGP or EIGRP uh, routing configuration. Sure. So the, uh, I did mean to ask the other thing was was with PFR. Um, and I guess I don't know if two and three are different, but what um, when you're defining the policy, what options mm -hmm. do you have in terms of making the choice? So, so you can you can turn around and say, yeah, I, I want this primarily on on um, internet, and then I want it to fail over to MPLS if it if it if it needs to. Can you do? I, I assume given that it's called performance routing, you can mm -hmm. do stuff based on. Yeah and latency and 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 that kind Absolutely. of stuff. So, so how how it works is obviously there's a layer that like first of all the there's a, it's like quas kinda like you know so you've got you've got, instead of classification and marking you've got the classification uh, the classification is done in one or two yeah. ways right? right so so well there's two there's two ways so there's n bar which gives you the layer seven application visibility and control. Right, and that would be a more dynamic way of doing it because nine. If you let, let's say you've got, let's say you've got fifty apps on your network. Yeah. Now, if you were to go with like traditional, and this is where it, like SD WAN differs from like traditional one. If you were to go with um, uh, 
a traditional one, you would say, right, if I want to um, get that, um, if I if I wanted to make a routing decision based on cause marking in a BGP network or something, it would need to be marked or remarked at the router uh, before it goes out onto the native like WAN MPLS network, right? Um, with using the MBAR technique, the traffic, the packet just comes in, the router uses the NBAR technique. If you've created an application policy, there's two ways you can do it. You can do an application policy, uh, which uses the NBAR technique. So it looks inside the packet, layer seven payload says, and it has to fit within like, you know, the Cisco NBAR pack that's on the router. So if you've got some, or, or you can do a custom application. So you could recognize it by se several different ways. So you could say, but anyway, then 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 you, you say, right, so, for that application, um, there's two things that you can do with it. Um, before I go into that, though, the other way you could do it is if when it arrives or at the router, let's say EF is marked from the phone and trusted all the way through the network, you could you can mark you can match on. So you basically match on NBAR application or you match on yeah. DSCP value. Okay. Those are value. The, those okay you can match right so then it says right now i've matched on you uh i've got i've got a couple of things that i can do with you um i can I, i've got a thing called path preference which is part of pfr and that's the uh, prefer inet one then inet two then right. i uh, then mpls one then mpls two and then it might be fallback bgp or fallback uh, uh global, i can't remember what the command is but you can fall back to basically the routing table or, yeah. or define a path of last resort, right? So so that's that's path preference. You can yeah. also do balancing, uh, which is on only I think it's only on the default class, but um you can do load balancing. So if it's not matched on a policy and it's just like yeah. default ESCP zero, it, it it will go um MPLS if if you set it up like that. So it will then load that's so that's that's kind of related to the path preference as well okay. if you want to do that so yeah so what i was what I was talking about there was um uh, we were talking about like you know the traffic comes into the router the layer seven payload in the n bar case uh let's let's pretend like uh um we've got like citrix traffic and i, I can't remember what citrix uh, uh metrics require um uh, off the top of my head, so we'll make them up. But it's just to uh, illustrate the illustrate the concept. So uh, I start off my Citrix session. It, it starts trying to get to the data center. Um, it goes through the local site router, which is the IWAN router, where then running PFR uh, version three or version two or whatever. Um, NBAR kicks in, and the uh, application visibility and control sees it's an NBAR packet by looking in the layer seven payload. And then says, right, um, now now that I've seen that you're a, a, a Citrix packet, I'm going to send you up like internet link one, but only if your latency, jitter, and packet loss meet the criteria that I have defined in my PFR version three policy. Now, if let's say like the packet loss, let's say it's 5% for Citrix, right? And we start losing like six or 7% and there's a threshold that once that's hit, you can then decide to make a decision. So you could say, if you, uh, if my packet threshold, uh, packet loss threshold is five percent, uh, and you go over that for whatever amount of time, then I want you to send tra send the traffic over the MPLS network, right? So, uh, however, you might say, well, if this would be quite pointless, you, but but it might be a, a valid use case. So you might. Yeah. You might send uh, the traffic over um, the, the INET initially, um, but then do nothing with it if it if it fails because you might it's not want to yeah. use the other link or uh, the other link might not be capable of doing it. And and yeah, so so that's where the performance aspect really comes in. So it's basically so, packet is, loss and latency that you can is it, find is it that. Sending probes across the the, the um transport yeah. or what how's it measuring that yeah so 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 
PFR has uh, does send basically synthetic probes, um, smart probes they call them, and you again you can configure how often you want them to be set. But to be honest, like every I1 that I've dealt with, it just went with the defaults. So there's nothing from that smart probe perspective, uh, and that's and that's all achieved by uh, um, the configuration. So the configuration on the hub routers like tells the spoke routers what path it is right so uh, hub hub one might have on its like tunnel interface um mpls one hub two might have on its uh, dmvpn tunnel interface am inet one so mpls one inet one and then in the other data center it might be like the mpls router is like am mpls two so that's path id so that's a path id right um, and then, and then the second internet router in the other data center is like I'm INET to. So, um, and then that communicates. And then when you do like uh, when you do like some of the show commands on the P and within PFR, uh, when you get down to when you go onto the spoke sites, uh, so so I think it's like show domain. Uh, so so it's the border that that is being instructed which path to send right. it over, right? So, so if I'm a if I'm a if I'm a border router down at one of these remote sites, just let's just say this one down here that I'm highlighting, um, which doesn't actually have two links, so I'll just quickly draw it in. Uh, so if that's link one and that's link two, uh, or path ID one and path ID two, um, then and then it's receiving it from like that's one and you know path ID two on the DMVPN tunnel interface. Yeah. Uh, that's that's dictating which way you send the path traffic. So if I go on to like this router here and I do show uh, domain I1, I mean there's nothing there's nothing in the P, funnily in the PFR config. There's no such a, a word as PFR anywhere, <laughs> which is quite funny. But uh, it's like show domain I1. Uh, oh, no, so, oh, sorry, show domain whatever your I1 domain is called. Yeah. Uh, and it's like something like border exits or master policy and then what it'll do is it'll give you an output that uh, that tells you um you know what exits you actually have available so it'll say and it'll it'll basically say like uh, mpls1 because you have to give it a name and then a path id okay you could have like mpls and then uh like the path id is like one and then you could have like MPLS, which is the path ID too. So mm -hmm. it's just a label. Yeah. And then that, again, it all ties into like, again, we, we need to take this offline and have another conversation, but it all ties into um, the underlying BGP configuration as well. Yeah. So um, where where you, you know, you get that, uh, those those preferences and that from, there's, uh, I'll, I'll end up going off on a tangent if I go into that. Yeah. So I can't, I can't cover everything. I think what might be, might be, if anyone uh, wants to know more, they can they can uh, drop us a mail, right? Yeah, exactly. I think what might be uh, beneficial if uh, I quickly bring up a PFR config. Yeah, uh, I've downloaded all the configs from the uh, Cisco. Uh, this is a proper freestyle. If you can, it's now uh, twenty-five to eleven, and my uh, nearly two-year-old is screaming upstairs. <laughs> Flagging them. Background apologies. Uh, <laughs> so let me. Let me just open uh, this up. Uh, edit Notepad plus plus. So I'm just going to share a different screen. So um, this is this is actually from uh, if we go to uh, quickly if I show you this. Uh, and then I can cover off like the 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 stuff about like the design documents and that here as well. So if you just Google like Cisco IWAN design documents, right? Um, you'll and then you'll uh, I think that's what I googled. Uh, so IWAN CVD, right? Hit this design zone branch one, and this is what I was talking about earlier. So when you hit this page, you see uh, software defined one SD WAN design guides and all that. You scroll down. Um, all branch, so this is branch office and SD-WAN, so it's not only SD-WAN, it's branch office and SD-WAN. Um, 
so there's a few different, there's an internet edge design, but these ones here eh, that are titled SD1, they're all Vip Teller. Yeah. Uh, and in order to access the i1 guys, you actually have to go explore archive, uh, which is what I was uh, talking about earlier. And then you'll see that um, there's the i1 design summary, i1 deployment guide, uh, configuration files guide, which is the one that I got all these sample configs. So uh, you'll see here on this. Um, on this file, I, I just you can download all of these configs, which is what I done, uh, and then I'm just opening up them up in uh, Notepad plus plus. But um, this uh, I want so so as you see, there's loads of different. There's a scalability guide, data center deployment guide because there's actually considerations that you need to um, go through with I want if you have like a data center interconnect and whether and if it's layer two versus layer three, there's different considerations, etc on how you advertise your prefixes into PFR and well it's you know there's, there's quite a bit to it to understand. Uh, multi-transports, multi-VRF. So uh, I deployed started deploying multi-VRF before that design guide was actually released. Uh, <laughs> but we knew it was coming and we were waiting on it. So we were just you know working through it. But yeah. um, and then you see what we mentioned earlier, you see this batch was updated in twenty September twenty seventeen. So that's one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight, nine, ten different IWAN design documents that, you know, when when uh, when it was the solution, you had to reference them all in order to make sure that your solution was compliant. Uh, and they're all like anything from 20 to 100 pages each. Um, well, well, we'll put the link to, to these in the uh, in the show notes because uh, then it's easy for people to find them, right, rather than go searching yeah, for them. Definitely. Um, so... So what I'm demonstrating here is, uh, or, or going to look at the configuration is I I want a dual hybrid. So just to, just to demystify is like that's what the session is called demystifying, right? Um, so this is dual hybrid. So uh, this is the 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 data center side. So dual hybrid would be hybrid is INET plus MPLS. So dual hybrid is two. DCs. MPLS routers, two internet routers, uh, with PLR, which is a path of last resort. So that's like a fifth transport. So that's like five transports. Uh, Multi-tunnel termination. So that's terminating multiple transport DMVPN tunnels, multiple DMVPN tunnels on the same router for different transports. Uh, with BGP, uh, so this part that I'm highlighting here, EGP mm -hmm. in the overlay uh, and the one aggregation talks about like it's the data center with a data center interconnect. So if I click on that, it takes me down to the configuration files, but this is what an I1 uh, with look at that diagram. Dual hybrid uh, dual hybrid um uh Path of last resort, multi-tunnel termination, uh, and a data center interconnect, which you see here, where I'm, you know, highlighting my mouse over. Um, what this basically means, this this can't be rolled out from a GUI, right? Regardless of whether it's greenfield or whatever, because in order to make this work, you need uh, to tweak local preference. So if you're a spoke site, you need to be able to say. Uh, prefer sport, uh, hub one two three four or five or whatever um, and then you also need so you need bgp communities typically in order to do that uh, to to be propagated into the ibgp overlay in addition to that you also need to define um, uh, bgp communities for the spoke site routes and the reason for that is that when um, when this route is sent up these these hubs on the left are the are the root reflectors that I talked about in my diagram earlier on or our diagram earlier on. Um, but once they receive them, they need to redistribute them into OSPF or something on the LAN in the data center, so that the data center knows how to get to these WAN sites. And uh, depending on which way it comes in the data center, you wouldn't want it coming in getting redistributed. We talked about this in the last video. Yeah. One thing you want is a routing loop, so it wouldn't come in data center two and then get advertised back out 
data centre one and then back in data centre two <coughs> for to cause a meeting loop. And um, but also if it comes in data centre two and you've got a data centre interconnect, you don't want it to come in data centre two and then go back uh, and go go out just go out data centre one. If it comes in data centre two, it goes out data centre two, back out to the site out of data centre two. And how you how how they're achieving that in the IWAM design is like um, you set a BGP community. So let's just like quickly zoom in. Sorry, this is going off a bit on. I, I will get back to the bar a bit in a minute. But basically, if you look here, you've got um, uh, where's the BGP communities? Uh, um, just the arrow, uh, the arrows coming out of the spoke sites. Yeah, here. So, like this, for example. So that's saying advertise my routes from this router R. That's our, like this router here that yeah. uh, is being highlighted. Um, tag my routes with sixty five one hundred colon ten community. Now, um, what? You'll have to take my word for this because I'm not opening uh, the hub config up. You can look at it uh, yourselves if you're watching this video and you're interested. But the reason for that, you see the, the communities here are 65, 100, 100, whereas here it's 65, 110, colon 10. Uh, as I said, like from the left to right direction, so the hub's advertising uh, to the spokes, that's, that's about pop select. So select yeah. your preferred hub. Uh, yep. The community is being advertised from right to left. Is what happens there when you look in the, the these example configurations um, on all of the hubs? What uh, is achieved? Sorry, what is achieved with the use of that community is they actually match on that community when they're redistributing from BGP into OSPF. Yep. So what happens on just for example on one of those hubs is it would it would say um, let me see if I can do this. Just quick screen sketch. Don't think it really work. It doesn't really like it. Uh, let's try it. Screen sketch, right? So, um, <clears throat> so, so, where was it? So that's sixty-five zero zero ten. What happens is uh, that's advertised. Let's just say over to here. Um, it's matched and then it's redistributed into OSPF. But then it might say if if uh, if if I'm the preferred route coming in from the WAN. Uh, and let's just say 100 is uh, the the preferred OSPF cost for it to come back in the opposite direction. So what happens is um, it receives the local preference. Uh, it, it receives the preferred pop select local preference left to right uh, based on the BGP community, right? And then, but then coming from right to left, the hub matches on 65. 100 colon 10 upon redistribution into OSPF and a route map and then as a result of matching on that it will set like a cost to ensure that when it comes back that way it comes out via this hub yeah yeah With you. because when you've got like what how many six hubs there and a DCI all in the same OSPF domain so and that's that's all done via CLI. There's no way to that I know of to like click a button in uh, APIC EM when it was kicking about to say do all my BGP communities for me. Just yeah. I mean and, I think like, like ACI is a lot better for that, but um, yeah. with the APIC, I mean, but, yeah. it's it's all because it's fundamentally under the hood. It's IOS, it's um, BGP and OSPF and all those things. That we already know, and and I guess that's that's the thing here, isn't it? Um, you start to look at some of the other SD WAN techniques, and you mentioned Cisco SD WAN, formerly Viptela. It's done from the ground up, so you you don't have that that, but then you don't necessarily have that same level of flexibility um, in in the provision. So you know, it's one yeah, six of one and half a dozen of the other, isn't it? So yeah, so. Um, sorry about that. Slight. Uh, we're nearly done. Uh, this is our. This is our. This is our PFR policy, right? Um. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I wish I had a live router to demonstrate this. This. So this example. This is the other thing. So, 
Um, a couple of the, the IWANs that I've worked on, they, they do use application, but this is a DSCP based policy, right? A um, couple of things to cover here. Um, that, so this is a DSCP based policy. And, and, and if, we, if we just work through this, this is, this is on the master controller in the data center, right? So um, if we, did I close that down? uh so so that's uh yeah so if i go back to my diagram which is on the screen and clear all that stuff it's this guy here yeah right, so that's the master controller that's the config we're looking at at the moment so the so the master controller that the hub master controller is a router yeah. and it is um can can it be one of the one of the DMVPN hubs as well, or does it not, need to be not for a, for a validated design in the in the data center in the hub? No. Okay. Um, it's typically you know these ones that are highlighted in black. The recommendation is uh, if this was a secondary master controller, which uh, you only define the policy on one master controller, even if you've got redundancy, right? Uh, I'll, I'll try and talk briefly about it. How are we doing for time? Uh, I need to wrap it up soon, I think. So, but but yeah, so 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 yeah, the the, the recommendation I think is just from a scaling perspective. Uh, but these are all one thousand ASR one Ks. So yeah, yeah, that's that's a recommendation. So an ASR one K for uh, I one hubs, uh, whether it's like a dedicated hub or a multi tunnel termination. I think you can use a forty four fifty one for a a lower end but it doesn't give you much headroom for uh, scalability um yeah. but you still need to, i think you can use a 4451 as an mc as well but that's all that information is in the in the cbds yeah. um yeah. but you do separate it out at the hub site so that it's a dedicated appliance router uh, it could be it could also be a csr 1000b i think okay. in the, in the newer version yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know that that was on the roadmap, but I don't know whether it ever uh, transpired. I think it did. Um, but yeah, so as long as it's got like the IOS XE functionality for PFR V3, um, I think the only reason it wasn't validated was they just needed to test uh, the CSR version 3. But if you wanted to lab it up, you could, uh, with the latest CSR V image and IOS version and all that, you could replicate the functionality. Sure. Um, but yeah, you split it out in the data center and it's shared. Uh, at the at the spoke sites, uh, it's MC slash BR uh, BR at the spoke sites, um, and yeah, I think it's just like to provide demarcation between uh, different different things, uh, so because it's doing all the heavy lifting. So yeah. so what I've drawn out there, like you configure this MC policy, which I'm about to go back to, and then it pushes it out to those one sites and all the other ones that you've got on the network. So you know. It pushes it out to the MCs, all the different sites. Now, uh, if we look at this, right? So this is what our, this is what an IWAN uh, PFR V3 policy looks like. So the configuration it starts off in global configuration mode. You go default, uh, sorry, uh, domain IWAN. So they call it a domain. Like there can only be one domain per IWAN. So you couldn't have like even if you got multi VRF. Um, you see how there it goes VRF default. That yeah. ties to the routing table so if you had like vrf2 you would do vr you would basically copy all this configuration that's here in this policy and then you would uh, like tweak it you would paste it in and then uh, so you you would do vrf2 right so 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 you create a policy per vrf but you can't but you can't distribute it Per, like within the VRF, as it were, like we were talking about earlier. So this, this is um, so so the building blocks, right? So you go domain I one, um, VRF default. And the other thing is remember this master controller in the data center is acting as the master controller for the DMVPN hubs slash border routers at the data center. So where at the spoke site you have like that MC slash BR box at the data center. You have an MC and a BR, right? And and the MC, but the MC, the difference is the MC acts as the policy master for the whole network, and that's why we call 
that's why when we get to the next the next part it says master hub mm. right so you then get into like you know the usual sort of management stuff uh, the um the the source interface is the loop back you usually have a dedicated loop back for pfr um so that you know, like you wouldn't share like your tac acts and your the loop back they use for tac acts and other management purposes uh, you would you would want a dedicated loop back um site prefixes Site prefixes are basically, again, read the IWAN documentation, but it's basically the prefixes that are within that data center. Yeah. So data center one, that's the site prefixes within that data center. Um, password, that's management stuff. Load balance advanced. This is, uh, it's not, I don't think it's on by default, um, or it is on, I think it, no, it's not on by default, I don't think. This is when, uh, when when traffic isn't caught by the PFR policy and it's in the default class, it gets load balanced across both links at the sites. So that's what that master load balance does. And then if you want to like tune it to say like so so just to enable that load balancing, you would just do load balance without the advanced keyword. If you put the advanced keyword in, uh, it takes you into like the next level down, and then you do path preference, inet one, inet two, fallback, and that that part there routing. Uh, is what I was talking about earlier on. If you lose your PFR, you've still got your global routing table. Global routing table, yeah, yeah, got it. So, so, so that's and then and then here you've got like this is like uh, this 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 would be like ten slash eight. So that's this the enterprise prefix is everything that you want to get captured by PFR that's yeah, not no, on your. Okay. Okay. So if if for example you had um specific um internet locations or or whatever so long as they don't appear in that prefix list they will just follow the rib yeah um yeah. across the vpn and, and whatever but obviously the the list of stuff that's that um you're wanting to affect using pfr you put in Is the entire and if it's not in the enterprise prefix and it's not in the site prefix, then it's classed as an internet route and it's not controlled. Not controlled. Fine. Yeah. So collector is like to send all this like information, and that's normally like a live action box. Okay. The There's box. NetFlow. Is it? Yeah. Uh, NetFlow box. NetFlow box. But live action is the product that was getting pushed if customers could afford it. That's all I'd say on that. But it's a good product. <laughs> but, you know, it's a it's. A, some some customer like big like I've got customers that use it. Uh, it's good, uh, and most most customers when they see it, they're like, "We'll find the budget for that because it makes mm -hmm. it easier to manage," and it that tells you like where all the traffic's flowing in real time because the Cisco okay. GUI tool isn't really that good for that, and no, live sure. action for it, but it does cost money. So yeah. I guess it, it use, yeah because you're not following the routing table, it's good to know uh, dynamically how things are. Uh, mm -hmm. How things are moving, right? So yeah, yeah. So uh, we're at the last bit now of the PFR. Uh, you'll be happy to hear, uh, which is basically putting it into action, right? So these, these, uh, just the, just the path preference. This is a path preference, right? Um, that I was talking about. Now, that's that's what I was talking about earlier on in the diagrams. We were saying the blue traffic goes this way and the green traffic goes that way. Uh, this is where you do it. But it's based on like the class. So this is like where you see it's like quite similar to QoS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Class, class voice. So a sequence ten. So this is just a class map. Um, this is a DSCP based policy. Um, so you see here that uh, it says match DSCP EF policy voice. Now policy voice. Uh, I need to uh, just bring this. So, but basically what you can do is you instead of policy voice you can do policy custom and what we talked about earlier on uh, uh, i want pfr uh, default hopefully it comes policy hopefully it's in here uh, doo -doo. policy i think it's on this here Here we go. This is so. 
So if you look here, right? So see how we were, we said, um, what was the command? Can't even remember. Match DSCP, so EF. So yeah. this is the first yeah. part. Um, and this could be match application Citrix. And and that's that's the difference, right, between an e, a, a DSCP-based policy yeah. and an application policy. What you cannot, you, you see here, uh, and I'll, uh, well, let me just finish off this part, explaining this line first. So what I'm saying is like for my voice traffic, because I want to match traffic that's come all the way uh, to, and this is pushed out to the local sites. So the local site router is implementing this policy. And what it says is match DSCP EF and then execute policy voice. Now, yeah. if we go back to here, policy voice means one way delay threshold is 150 milliseconds. Um, packet loss threshold is 1% and jitter is 30 milliseconds. And that's a canned voice policy. Yeah. If you go down to the next thing, this is still matching on DSCP CS4, but it, it, it also matches on AF41, AF42, AF43. Implement real-time video, right? So that's the class real-time video. And then, but from the path preference, uh, well, that's that. I think they're all the same. Uh, yeah, so INET, MPLS1, MPLS2, INET1, INET2, but it's executing a different canned policy. If you put custom in there, right, you would be able to, um, you would be able to go and define these numbers yourself. Right. So you could do like 750 millisecond or whatever, and then you could do 10% packet loss. My recommendation for customers is always why change it like this is all if you look here at the names this is like there's a custom there and it doesn't even give you i've looked at this document about 100 times and i don't think it gives you an example of custom <clears throat> it just says like look at these tables and you can do a custom one if you want because yeah. like customers could just go off and do any old like settings that don't really like relate to reality so um so yeah so so it's like this one, real-time video, right, um, which is here. And then all these others are, are based on the same sort of idea. The only thing here is, like, so see when you get down to bulk data, the path preference is INET1, INET2, then callback MPLS1, MPLS2. So basically, yeah, this, this one is saying prefer for, for anything that's that has that, low latency um, requirement or the um, the low jitter and, and low packet loss, push them over one of one of the two MPLSs first or MPLS one first, then MPLS two. Uh, and then if it fails um, and drops under, then use INET one and INET two. And then for bulk data and scavenger, it's basically, it's flipping that over, yeah. right? So yeah, now that makes, makes sense. Yeah. And when you see when you see like an app like so this is a DSCP based policy, but when you see uh, when you see like an application based policy, it could be like thousands of lines of code. But in reality, it's it's lots of like you know that uh, control C, uh, control V, uh, and then and then you've got you know what I mean like and then you change this to app two. Yeah. Uh, change the sequence, change the match to like whatever the name is in N bar to match on like the application, uh, yeah. name, like so exactly. On, and you can't. The other thing that you can't do is um, the recommendation. I don't. I don't like. Uh, I came across a scenario where it didn't make any difference, but this class name has to be an uppercase. I don't know whether that's just a, a best practice thing. We have seen the one in lowercase, and I thought that was causing an issue, but it actually yeah. worked. But it's recommended for that class name to be in a uh, uppercase. Um, Just for, for reading it. Yeah, it's it's yeah you can, the only other thing is you can't ma you can't match like match DSCP CS4 and then go match application with an M bar. So you cannot mix DSCP and uh, an application in the same class map. It has to be separate class maps. But it can all be different in the same policy. And when you actually, when 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 the concept that Iwan came out and they used APK M to do the demos and stuff, you probably seen the demos like working for a partner. And what they done is like they dragged the application 
uh, yeah. into this class or into yeah, yeah, yeah. default or whatever. What that was doing was if it ma- if it, if it, if it basically fell, if you said like that's critical, uh, and you had the policies defined elsewhere in APKM, it was basically generating the config in this PFR policy for the application. So match application, and it but it was all doing it in in the background. It um yeah, there's there's um a quas uh, an easy quas app that sits on top of APKM does something very similar, but for for a non IWAN. Uh, network so i guess it was just an extension of that really yeah i mean uh, and i think i think that's that kind of summarizes it. i think we're going to need to knock this presentation on the head the only other thing that was like design operational examples so i'm not going to draw them out or anything but uh, uh operational examples multiple hubs uh, uh the ones that i've worked on anyway there's been uh multiple hubs um uh, so that would be like with multiple transports and multiple different site types uh, uh, and multi VRF. So that was quite uh, uh, um, with DMVPN phase three. So all the tunnels were built spoke to spoke. Um, I've worked yeah. on another IWAN, which is a global IWAN with around 400 sites, uh, four or 500 sites. Um, and how that actually operates is. Uh, it, it's been in for a few years, so it was uh, the early adopter um, and like all corners of the globe, four regions and regional data centers. And what they actually, because it was the first version, they actually run hub and spoke within the region uh, and they run PFR and all that within the region. Yeah. But instead instead of like having one big IWAN globally with two hubs or whatever, um, they link it with like a backbone DMVPN network. So, so like the four, like the like the different data centers are just like a DMVPN phase three network. Whereas, like within the region, it's hub and spoke between IWANs. Yeah, so, and, so effectively, it's four IWANs with a yeah, with a DMVPN yeah, trans, a DMVPN transit between them. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then the only other like the the, the the other main iteration, other than like a standard IWAN deployment that I've seen is. Um, where you have like a single hub, but like multiple countries using that same hub, right? But multiple ISPs. So, so actually, that scenario that I said, like typically you see uh, one MPLS uh, globally and one, uh, well, internet doesn't like internet's internet, right? So it's like one big network, even if you take it from different carriers. But the example that I've seen, which was pretty interesting, was. Um, uh, the the customer peered to uh, like four or five different MPLS providers, right? From a switch, an aggregation switch, right? And the IWAN hub sat behind it. Wow. Okay. Right. So so the five MPLS providers to communicate between them, you would still have to come back to the uh, the DMVPN hub or through yeah. the DMVPN hub to build a tunnel. Like so so that's another way. It's like an aggregation site. And yeah, yeah. and it wasn't just like, oh, we decide there was a, a valid business case for it because like of availability of telcos in certain regions and compliance and all that kind of thing. Uh but yeah, so if you if you picture like uh, um and this uh, this'll this'll wrap it up. If I go back to that, uh I actually put it here. Um, so it was uh, this guy here. So MPLS aggregation switch, right? And 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 what what that might have been was like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it's like that, and then you had like different sites off these different. Um, I I guess so long as you've got. A routing table in each of those clouds that allows you to see um, uh, the routing that's required to get to the loopbacks in the others. Then, then, then it's all good, right? But yeah, so it's basically like there was like BGP run across all these ones that I just drew in yeah. into the uh, the the other underlays. So those yeah. are the three. Those are the three um, sort of and and Cisco Prime and Epic EM. I've hardly used them. That you know they're there. There's some template functionality, but 
see when you start going past like a greenfield network that you that you're rolling out brand new and you have to integrate and think about migration i mean there's three different migration techniques that we've not even touched on and we're not gonna uh, uh if you want to look at it it's greenfield i block and condensed and uh, those are all in like the cisco live i1 uh, presentations and all that um but but yeah that that kind of that that really like uh, finishes it off. I think we went went over time, so we need to see if we need to split the video into two or keep it into keep it into one. But um, as I said, like it's a it's a complicated that that's under the hood of an SD one. And I think like even even like that, you know, I don't know as much about the other SD ones. And this was I one's obviously one of the the first, and it is an SD one because it, it um, Cisco when they started selling it. They sold it based on the fact that it, it met all of the open network user group definitions mm. for SD1, uh, and it had APKM, which was anticipated that would work a bit better from a you know an automation and a and, and all that perspective. Mm. Um, it's obviously just evolved, and they bought Vitella, and that was that's working better for them and the more strategic product from an actual SD1, and then. People will be happy to know that I'm be handing that one right over to you to explain. <laughs> well, that's that. Yeah, so that's our, our next episode, I guess, is is going to be uh, to have a look at at an overview of uh, of Viptela. I, I I I bow to your knowledge. That was that was really detailed and and really uh, really good, really interesting. Lots to to go out there. So worth a worth a second uh, watch, I should imagine, if. Uh, if people are, are sort of getting involved with Iwan, so uh, yeah, thanks for that, mate. It, uh, it was really interesting. Um, I guess I guess we can wrap up. The the audience want to know about uh, from we did we only really touched on the PFR from a config perspective, but if there's any questions, there's other components to Iwan. Uh, you might you might not be deploying it, but you might be a consultant and you might come across it in the field. Uh, you might be migrating from Iwan to Viptela. You might be yeah. migrating from Iwan to something else. Uh, or, or you might be have a customer who's half deployed it and they're wanting to make the best of it and finish off a deployment, for example. So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, I can help and Darren can probably help uh, some as well if you've got any questions. And yeah. on that note, I'll hand it over because... Uh, that's that's cool. I was, all I was going to say was, you know, uh, any comments, corrections and criticisms always welcome um any any sort of questions about about um where to go with that uh you can contact us at um net freestyle on twitter you can email us at, at network freestylers at gmail.com or you can leave comments on the youtube channel or on the blog um at network freestylers.tech don't forget that one um yeah we look forward to, to hearing what anyone has to say really we just wanted to say really a big thank you to to all the people who've been in touch with us, our friends, our colleagues, and and people who've watched the videos, um, and offered us comments and and good wishes. It's been fantastic, hasn't it, Malcolm? The the, the feedback, uh, hearing what people have to say. So yeah, thank you for that, everybody. I appreciate um, it. Uh, not not every video will be an hour and a half or two hours. <laughs> We promise, but you know we're finding, our, we're finding our way. It's a new thing we're doing, as we've mentioned before. Um, yeah. We'll try and refine it. Uh, our target time uh, for most topics um, will probably be between 40 and 60 minutes, if not half an hour. Uh, it might do shorter takes, but um, I think like when you when you've lived in the product, like I mean, my first Iwan, I lived in it for eight months. So when I, once I start talking about it, it's hard to stop. But I mean, and, and why would we want to stop that are not like that, you know? <laughs> no, well, you know, we, as I say, the next one will probably be a little bit shorter, but uh, uh, <laughs> we'll see how we go. But no, thanks everyone for watching. If you've come this far with us, um, great, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you with the next episode, which will be Freestyle 104, um, an introduction maybe to Cisco SD1. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.